what I want to do is just go through some general ideas about um, data cleaning with you. Um, essentially, the idea, once again, is that you have that initial capture. Or maybe you just have data that you've gotten off of the internet or that a colleague has given to you. Any time that you touch a data set, you should do some of these exercises. Because sometimes a very good colleague will give you some really bad data. And if you just trust that blindly, you will make some mistakes in your research. And you don't want that to happen. But we also want to do this in a more formal sense, such that we can take a data set, improve it, document the improvements, and get those improvements out to the broader community. So essentially we're going to talk about, or I'm going to talk about with you, these points um, initially. Essentially what I want to do is talk about internal and external consistency in, in data. And then I'm going to give you two different examples that I've worked. So in general, one thing that we all have to get used to is the idea that error is universal. Okay? So I have had conversations with people at many biodiversity information institutions, for example, museums, where I'm told something along the line of, well, we have our data captured done, and we're all ready to serve the data, but we're cleaning the data first. Okay, we want to get our data perfect, and then we'll put it out. And you think, okay, that is either somebody who does not understand that error will be in that data set even after the data cleaning, or it's very simply somebody who doesn't want to share the data. Okay? Because it's a really, really good excuse. It's like saying, I won't invite anybody over to dinner at my house until there is no dust left in my house. Right? So data cleaning is not anything to be uh, ashamed of. It is a very positive step. It's essentially something that has to be done with every data set before any use. But it's a positive step. It's something that we do and that makes the data better. As I said before, existence of error in a data set is not a good excuse for not sharing the data or not using the data but you do need to do the data cleaning prior to use. Um, this is a really important point. We can go through a data set and clean it up for one particular application. You know, maybe you know, the, the niche modeling sorts of things that I do. And it may be still completely dirty and unsuitable for something else that we may use those data for. Okay, so, so when we talk about fitness for use or cleanliness of a data set, we have to remember that that is relative to the use to which the data set will be put. We can do kind of general cleaning, but there are still specifics that we would look at before particular uses. So very most generally, if somebody says to you, well, this data set has been cleaned up. There are no errors in this data set. You just say to them, ha. No. Say to them, excuse me, bullshit. Not true. Okay? Because, again, error is universal. You can't get rid of it. You can minimize it. You can characterize it. And best of all, you can incorporate it in any use to which you put the data. You understand it. You comprehend it and you incorporate it to its existence into whatever you do with the data, okay? So this is essentially what it comes down to, right? Nobody's ever gonna worry about those errors in the data, and at the end of the day, something blows up on somebody. Um, so, what are we looking at when we're doing these cleanups? Well, the most important thing is consistency. And consistency is a very broad term. It can be 
consistency amongst values. So for example, you might have a, a, a field that speaks to the sex of the organism that is in your database. And maybe one value is male and one value is female and another value is M and another value is F. Well now we have females described in two different ways. <coughs> female and F. Okay. All that does is introduce noise. It's, it's inconsistency in how we described the sex of the individual. Now the very best thing that we can do is cross-link amongst fields. Um, which is to say, within a data record, sometimes we can find two sources of information that speak to the same thing. So for example, maybe our data record gives us a latitude and longitude and it gives us an elevation. Well, for every latitude and longitude, we can figure out what the elevation is. <coughs> and in the best of all worlds, if our data are perfect, we get the same value via the latitude and longitude as we get via the elevation field. Okay, so there's an opportunity to look for internal consistency. But then we can also look for external consistency. So this is essentially the idea of asking whether a data set that maybe came from, you know, your zoological museum or your herbarium fits with other data sets. Other data sets external to that one. And so obviously that's even more powerful because it's somehow independent testing. So this, this process has got to be iterative. You go through, you go through again, you fix up the most problematic errors, and then you go and look at the finer scale errors, but it's always multiple times through, okay? So it's not something that we're going to do in an afternoon. It's something that you will do over months, years, decades. And that's okay. Just a little bit of a comment is on the difference between flagging errors, essentially signaling, this is an error, sorry, this is a record that probably has some problems versus fixing the errors. And I'm going to give you examples of both. Okay? It's generally a lot easier to say, ooh, there's something wrong about this error, about this record, than it is to say, oh, the real value is this and not that. That's the difference between flagging an error, signaling an error, and fixing it. So, as I said, it's very feasible to pick out individual records that are probably wrong. How they're wrong is a little harder. In what way or what should be the real value is harder. It's a lot harder to fix those problems than to detect them. Now, if it's a research project, if this is just something where you want to do an analysis for your thesis or write a research paper, the solution get, can be pretty easy. You can just take those high probability of error records and get rid of them. Right? You just ignore them because they're certainly going to be a source of, of noise in your analysis. And you can do that if it's just for you know, a research application. You know, maybe you originally had 500 uh, occurrence points and you throw away a hundred of them that, that somehow are, have some problems with them. I'm going to show you examples of, of those high probability error records. Um, so the easy thing to do is just to eliminate them. But if it's for what I'll call, call archival applications, these permanent biodiversity data sets that we've been talking about the last week and a half, you really can't throw those records away. Instead, you have to document them. You have to uh, signal the potential for problems. When you can, you have to correct them. And perhaps the most important thing is you have to document exactly what you did. 
Okay, you don't just go in and correct the latitude and longitude because maybe your correction is a mistake. Maybe the collector really was at that site and you move the coordinate somewhere else. Somebody in the future may have better information than you did. So you have to document exactly what was done and preserve the original values. That's why Darwin Core has all of those things that are verbatim locality or verbatim date rather than interpreted in any way. Okay? And the last thing is, you know, if we're, if we're in this research mode and we just throw away records, it may well be that those records that are high probable, high probability of error or that have problems in them, um, it may well be that those records are important and really teach us something about the biology of the species. So in that sense also, we don't really want to throw them away. So that's just some, some kind of a general overview of, of these ideas. So let's give you a quick uh, illustration of internal consistency. Um, and I just pulled a record out of VertNet. And all I want you to see is, you know, these are, the, these are uh, values in Darwin Core fields. It gives us a catalog number, preserved specimen. But then it gives us USA, Marin County. Everybody knows that Marin County is in California. I don't know why it's not in here. Um, and then we have a locality that is San Rafael Hill in San Rafael. So there is one description of a place, and here's a different one. This is exactly the exercise that you guys did the other day. How well does a field, a set of fields like that describe this place? And here are some latitude and longitude coordinates. And so essentially what we can ask is whether those coordinates fall in the USA, whether those coordinates fall in California, which is a field that's left out in this, in this record, or whether they fall in Marin County. So right away we have three levels of checks and notice that they're all internal to our data record. They don't depend on anything else. They just depend on whether these coordinates fall in those places. Okay, so that's, a, that's an, an internal consistency check. And when you see a disagreement, it means that something's wrong. It might be the coordinates, or it might be the textual description of the geography. Maybe it wasn't in Marin County. Maybe it was in the next county over. Okay, so again, this doesn't give us the answer or the right value. All it does is say, hey, wait a minute, something's wrong. 